This is the Heritage Listed Strand Arcade in downtown Sydney. Built in the 1890s, this Victorian building is the home to Restaurant Pendolino, owned by Nino Zoccali and his wife Crisula. A second generation Italian, Nino was brought up in Western Australia and opened Cafe Contadino in the Margaret River when just 25. He moved to Sydney in 1998, heading up the opening team at Otto and worked with Stefano Manfredi at La Mensa and Del Mondo. Today, Nino and his wife own and operate the restaurant Pendolino and La Rosa. Welcome to Gomeo, Nino. Lovely to have uh, to chat with you. Um, you were brought up in a typical Italian family where good food was central to family life. How has this influ influenced your style? Well, I think I kind of, I guess I was being trained in food from the day I was born, really. Um, my father's a migrant from southern Italy, but my mother also an Anglo-Australian in the southwest of Western Australia, and that side of the families have been cattle farmers for for nearly a, nearly a century. So uh, it was a strong link, even on my mother's side, the Anglo side, to farming and to agriculture and to produce. On dad's side, like any Italian migrant, he's uh, particularly um, you know, obsessed around food and creating his own food and growing and bartering within the Italian community. And I guess I just was brought up, you know, I always, always make the joke, but it's, it's true, I always say, you know, when I was growing up, I used to say to my mum and dad, can't we act like normal people and go to the supermarket and buy some food? Do we have to grow everything? Of course, nowadays I look back on that with such fondness and I had really an extraordinary upbringing, really. You know, we'd make everything like a lot of migrant families do, you know, all the charcuterie, um, lots of, you know, tomato sauce. The sauce was done every year. Dad would literally grow everything. I mean, we would eat beans for eight weeks in a row, of course. Um, but... I just, and I didn't really get how good it was until I got sent off to boarding school to go and play soccer in Perth. And I grew up in West, near Bunbury and, and uh, near Cape, where the, the mum side of the family's from. Um, and then I just, I just, once I sort of moved out of home, I, and I got a real understanding of, you know, how we ate fresh food every day growing, often picked the same day. Well, that was pretty, that was just, that was what life was for us growing up. So what, so what was your original vision for, for the restaurant Pendolino? Well, yeah, it's, you know, I came to Sydney and um, uh, it was, I was part of the, I was sort of headed up the, the, the team in the kitchen at Otto back in two, 2000, just before the Olympics. And, and that was just a crazy couple of years. And then after that, I did consultancy work. Um, before that, I sort of had a, I, I sort of did an undergraduate double degree in economics and Italian before I become a chef, so I'm sort of very versatile. Versatile, pretty handy in, in some, in a lot of ways. Um, and so I sort of, sort of lent a little bit back on my academic sort of background and provided consultancy service for about five years. It was really, really fascinating. And the Pendol Pendolino sort of came up um, as an opportunity. I originally was pitching for it to be a consultancy gig. Actually, it was I wanted to put a Vietnamese tea rooms in here. Um, the landlord didn't want to do that, and my wife, business partner, sort of looked at me and said, are you effing crazy? This is where the olive oil restaurant has to go. And, um, and I thought, oh, what the heck, I'll, I'll put together a little PowerPoint presentation with some nice visuals and see what happens. I'm not sure if they'll like it. And then 24 hours, like, how much money do you need? You know, the landlord's a Singaporean sovereign fund. It went to Singapore, the Singaporeans went fantastic, love it, let's get started. So it was like crazy. And then, you know, we, then we sort of opened and the rest is sort of history. Italian food is all about uh, regions and tradition. How do you relate this to Australia? Well, I think, um, I think in Australia, I mean, regional, uh, you're right, like, a, you know, in Italy, there's not really a, a, a Italian cuisine doesn't really exist. It's, it's, it's you know, and even in, within regions, it's like every five kilometres, dishes will change. Um, so, Really in Australia, the concept of doing Italian food, I guess you can broadly speak in those terms because pasta, you know, everywhere in Italy, pasta's done really, really well and it's not really done like that anywhere else in the world. And of course, Asians do noodles and stuff, but not in that European way. And it's something that really differentiates itself from the rest of European cooking. And the, border, the borders and the boundaries kind of really define that. Um, so, 
really in Australia, the concept of an Italian restaurant, probably it was a hangover from the early days of migration where people would do, let's call it the hits of Italian cooking, bolognese sauces, Napoli from the south, and really um, kind of make it work for an Anglo, predominantly Anglo clientele. As migration has continued and gone on, and as the Australian sort of like you know, social makeup has become so diverse, um, it's really opened up, and, and as you know, sort of affluence and people travelling and seeing new things, um, the ability to really specialise in regional cuisine has been something that's really, really gone crazy. So, but so we, we the way we approach it is we really like to do things authentically well, but based on different parts of Italy. So we're still a little bit of a hits of the Italian, but everything's handmade here. All the breads are handmade, all the pastas handmade. So for us, it's really we want to be the best sort of, uh, we want to take the best of regional Italian cooking and do it as, as well as you could possibly do it anywhere. And um, we're quite traditional in that way. Um, although we, you know, we, we, we also are really um, now, probably now more than ever, starting to open up to uh, produce. Of course, you're always sort of, you're always heavily influenced by what's available to you in, in wherever you are in the world. And, and he is no different and we've got amazing produce in Australia. Um, but we're also now starting to get some indigenous products as well. In a way, just so, but it's, it's not going, we're, we're never in a way that really isn't going to not reflect the dish as well as, as it can be done in its own region. So, like for example, salt bush, we're doing a, a cannelloni at the moment, or a, a pumpkin cannelloni, and we, we're doing crisps, uh, like a, instead of doing a burnt sage butter, we're doing a burnt butter with, with, with salt bush. And it's amazing, it's beautiful. It, it, it wouldn't be out of place in Italy if you served it. You know, Italians eat it here and they go, don't know what that is, but it tastes beautiful and it, it tastes Italian, even though we're using like an indigenous product. So, excellent. What are some of the learnings and challenges of running a premium restaurant in what is a, a tough economic time? Yeah, I mean, I think, as I sort of, I would say that to start, you really say that they're complex businesses to run because, you know, you have people, some businesses, if they're lunch service and dinner service, uh, your span of operation or having people that you're actually on the premise can run from, you know, 6.30 in the morning through to 3.30 the following morning if you're busy doing late services and, you know, um, so they're, they're really complicated businesses to run. They're, they're, they're multifaceted. There's so much that actually goes into them. They're really, really time sensitive as well and more and more and more. So I think if you go anywhere in the world now, I'm not sure that you can serve food too quickly anymore to people because... Um, there's just this sense that people want to want to have things in a pretty quick time frame. Yeah. So there's a lot of pressure actually to deliver and it's a highly, highly competitive industry. There's barriers to entry virtually don't exist. So long as you've got the ability to write a cheque, you can pretty much own a restaurant. And I think the plethora of sort of television shows that have come out really, rather than really encouraging young people to go and learn a craft of cooking and, and follow that passion, they've just encouraged uh, middle and high management corporate sector to go and invest in restaurants. So it's, and, and, and it's, you know, it's a really, really, um, you know, it's a highly, highly competitive uh, industry. So you're really being governed by price um, and in, to maintain consistency of quality, you know, sort of making comment back on, on quality establishments and doing that, it's really, um, you know, I think that it's, it's consistency is really, really, you know, really, really important. It always has been important for us. And um, look, it just gets challenging. The labour market's really, really challenging in Australia. Recent changes to the federal law mm -hmm. of 457 has made it really, really difficult. Um, we run our, largely run our businesses in Australia. You know, it's, it's an economic success story like nowhere else in the world and in advanced economies where this happened, typically hospitality sector jobs, are, they're, not, they're not from people of the same, of, of their, you know, originally from there. They're, they're largely filled by migrant, um, uh, a migrant workforce. And so long as that's managed really, really well, I mean, I don't see a problem with that, but it's really, really difficult, you know. The, the government goes out and promotes Australia as being world-class dining scene, which I think it is, and then really gives us the main resource that we struggle with in Australia, which is really human resource, um, really just seems to be making that more and more difficult. Um, and 
it's it's complicated, but it's it's but that's probably the difficult one of the most difficult things that everyone really talks about. So it's a challenging business, but it's one you're still passionate about. Oh, I'm you know, people say, how did you get into this? I said, you know, my my comment, my regular comment is that you know some things choose you, you don't choose them. You know, whilst I was doing an, an undergraduate uh, studying at university, I always worked worked in hospitality business. I just got I just found them so fascinating. I grew up with produce. I, I grew up with extraordinary produce. Um, we had our own livestock and dad would slaughter, he's got his own little cool room and the, the whole thing and I just, I think the transformation of agricultural products or produce from the garden into something really amazing on the plate or something that people can enjoy in a social setting for me is kind of what has sort of been central to living and to do that professionally was just exciting and um, you know, I think everybody, I think it's sad in Australia that people are really often discouraged for going into hospitality um, because it's such a creative thing and it's such a beautiful thing and, and I think that you know there are great opportunities for people as well globally that, that to, to do what they do um, you know I'm a big proponent of transitioning apprenticeships into tertiary tertiary opportunities as well I think that link really needs to be made so that people feel like they can they can train as a chef really understand the mechanisms of how restaurant kitchens run or front of house they could train you know front of house uh, restaurant management and um, specialise in wine and then you know one day go on to be represent global brands you know in wine and, and other beverages I think it's such a magnificent potentially stepping stone to to corporate careers as well but we're just not looking at it like that very exciting well, I see you're about to launch a new book new cookbook the Venetian Republic yes very excited about it it's been very well received so far so we're it was in store early this week and it's been very well received. We've got online orders of going bananas, which is fantastic. Um, and yeah, there's a, it's a, uh, you know, they're big work, they're big uh, projects, cookbooks, and I've had immense help with the book and uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's one of my, on one of my favourite places, the influence of the Venetian Republic, uh, which was a major trading, um, Thalassocracy, it's called, so a right. water, water controlled empire, yep. um, and put, which really, you know, they were like the, the Amazon of the era because they controlled the major logistic, which was the boats through the Mediterranean. And, uh, and people don't, a lot of people don't know that Venice didn't, didn't really evolve in a vacuum, it evolved because it was the seed of, of, a, of an amazing trading power, yep. and they made a lot of, made a lot of money, high, high margin trading. And they invested it in this cultural, amazing place, which is Venice. Excellent. And uh, the book's available now, isn't it? Book's available now. Mm -hmm. Great Christmas present. Great Christmas present. Well Birthday presents. <laughs> and of course, you can come and experience Nino's wonderful cooking at La Pandorina and La Rosa. And La Rosa, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Nino. Well, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.